Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fantasy Labs. This is a show that we run here on Twitch on TV slash D and D time. We run it every Sunday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Sometimes we run it an hour earlier than that when we do our lab experiments, but most of the time it's going to be at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, how's it going, everybody? I am Jeremy. I'm one of your two dungeon masters for this show. Uh, my other dungeon master, my my cohort, my compatriot, Pete, is um. Well, he's not here right now because he's he's caught up in the great old working thing that people have to do. Uh, but he'll be here probably later in the evening for more fun Dungeons and Dragons shenanigans. I see we've got a bunch of people hanging out in the chat as expected. We got a lot of cool stuff to talk about today. I see Frosty and Angstaza and uh, a V Bunny and everybody hanging out doing. Uh, I hope everyone's doing good tonight. Uh, I talk about the illithrid going on in the chat. The, King of uh, Elephants? Yeah, I mean, kind of. He's the, the, the Litherid, this guy is in the corner there. There we go. Right, right out of my finger. Big spooky Illithid monster. Uh, Mind Flayer creature. It's kind of like the Mind Flayer Patriarch almost. But yeah, uh, like I was saying before, this is a show where we talk about homebrew for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Specifically about the art of creating homebrew and understanding content in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you know, once you understand how to make your own stuff for this game, you can really do whatever you want with the framework the system has. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's very exciting. It's very freeing. Uh, I think everyone who ever runs a game in this, uh, this kind of system eventually wants to start making their own stuff for it. But uh, yeah, everybody's doing good. Uh, uh, everybody excited to be surrounded by Canadians? Oh, I'm excited for the stream. Everybody, I'm glad you're excited. I am as well. Um, I hope I got the most updated version of the stuff you made. I hope so too. And speaking of the stuff you made, we got a big and exciting uh, day planned today. So um, we did something a little unusual uh, for today's show. We gave out our first lab homework. <laughs> uh where um we put out a prompt and then anyone who wanted to uh make something for that made something and uh we're gonna look at what everyone made and see what cool uh ideas we can pull from it because i mean one of the big pros of this show just in general is getting inspired by other people's ideas i cannot open this can of red bull which is making me thirstier uh looking at your model i did it all wrong Angsthaza, I wouldn't say you necessarily did it wrong. There are a bajillion different ways to do this, and uh, I went in a very minimalist direction. Um, but I'm very excited to see the kind of things that people did come up with. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, today uh, our lab homework was to create a plant monster that would exist in an Arctic environment. Um, in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, terrains are categorized very broadly into, I think it's 10 different categories, Arctic being one of them. And one of the interesting things about it is there are, and, and monsters are categorized into one of, I think it's 12 categories, plant being one of them. And the interesting thing is there are no plant monsters that are categorized for use in an Arctic environment. Uh, that kind of makes sense because Arctic environments, typically, you know, they have little shrubs and shrub brush, if anything, uh, maybe some flowers, but not really a lot, a lot. It's kind of harsh uh, terrain. But I was just, I figured there'd be at least one or two um, that would be relevant for use or tagged to be used there. So that's kind of why I wanted this prompt. Uh, I went and looked on Reddit. We use reddit.com uh, slash honest arcana uh, a lot of the time to look at content that other people have made. And I could not for the life of me find a single plant monster um, for Arctic environments there. Um, so folks, we might be making the first here. These might be the first plant ar Arctic plants in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, there's, yeah, v Bunny, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. There's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, there's a million different ways to create monsters, to create content, and to share ideas in Dungeons and Dragons, or just in any kind of collaborative storytelling environment. It doesn't have to be D&D. &D. Um, 
So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry if what you did doesn't look like what I did here with my cold snap, uh, which is currently up on the screen. You know, people can do things a million different ways. This is, mine is probably the laziest, frankly. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why once we, uh, once we get cracking with this. Um, but yeah, so our, our schedule today, just so folks are aware of what we're, we're going to do, uh, we're going to start out talking about these Arctic plants because I think they're pretty cool and a fun, a fun topic to explore and hopefully get inspired by. Uh, after that, we're going to move on to talking about a couple of new releases uh, from us at Fantasy Labs. Uh, we have polished up our Night Domain uh, cleric and our uh, worm patron warlock. Uh, which I'm very excited to, uh, to share with you guys. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm very happy about where those came out. Both of those came from our previous lab experiments. Um, and then after that, I did find a couple of cool Arctic monsters on Reddit that I'd like to talk about. Uh, and if, you know, we still have time at the end of all of that, uh, I really want to give the lion's share of the time to talking about these plants that everyone puts time into because they're very exciting. Uh, and I think a huge hole in the D&D &D monster ecosystem. But uh, if we still have time, we can start looking back at some of the other completed works and uh, projects that people have been sharing for the last week or so on our Discord. And if you want to share your stuff on, your, on our Discord and look for feedback and advice, just be part of our creating community, uh, you can do that by going to our website, dndtime.stream, and clicking on that old Discord button. And that'll bring you right to our Discord. Oh my goodness. Hello, everyone. Oh my goodness. I want to say, Frosty Pirate, thank you so much. Resubscribing, supporting d, &D time. I really, I really appreciate it. I know Pete does, but he's, he's not here at the moment. But thank you so much for, uh, for all the support, Frosty. We really appreciate it. Uh, I see four hours ago in stealth, in secret, uh, Vasil Zeju, uh, otherwise known as Dendere Ninja or Ideal from Beating Jeremy's D&D &D time, uh, was to resubscribe for 27 months. <laughs> Oh my, mama, that's a, that's a lot of time. Thank you so much, Ideal. Um, and I want to give another shout out to Purple Riot, Moonhoof DTS, and Grim1506, all for following the channel. We really appreciate your, your follow. I'm glad that what we were doing here was enough to uh, get that old follow button out of you. Um, hopefully you come back and you watch more of our stuff because honestly, we make some cool stuff. Um, it also puts us ever closer to our Monster Mash goal, uh, which once we have reached 25 new subscribers upon this segment of the show on Fantasy Labs, we will do a special, uh, a special segment where we create a monster, and that monster will be the natural predator of a monster of chat's choosing. So if you guys can decide, you know, if you're like, oh man, I really want to find the natural predator of a woolly mammoth, well, hell yeah. We get to make a natural predator for woolly mammoth. If you're like, I want the natural predator of a mind flare, then we gotta somehow figure out what that is. Uh, just a fun way of thinking about a monster, right? Coming up with a concept. Uh, <laughs> flip note, don't you worry. You're right on time. We just start. You were asleep. I will say, flip note, sleep is a beautiful thing. Natural predator of a zombie Terrask. That's gonna be a tough one. Uh, I see Saul, just Saul. D &D time, D, D time, is that a combined 25 follows slash subs? Um, nope, that's just a 25 follows. Don't, we're not worrying too much about subs. Thank you so much if anyone does opt, decide to uh, subscribe and, and support us. But we started off with just a little easy follower goal uh, for now. And Yanaril also joining in with the follow. Thank you. And I see Maddie's hanging out. Everybody's hanging out. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks all for being here. Again, Pete will be with us shortly. Uh, but let's let's dive right into our little our little chitter chat. Oh my goodness, twelve sided guy also follow. See, it's all of the lurkers hiding in the shadows. But thank you so much again, uh, everybody. Subs are tasty sandwiches. They are tasty sandwiches on Sava. I agree. Let's talk a little bit about these icy monsters. So plant monsters are really funky because they fit a very broad category um, of, of creatures. And it's just anything that is 
that is like a grown creature. Some of them are, are like predatory in nature. Some of them are like bipedal, almost like human-like. Like the veggie pygmy is a great example of a, I mean, they're, they're basically just a human, but they're a plant. Um, and they're very strange. You can get tree ants, which are just trees, but you can also get things like creeping funguses and violet molds and um, myconids and all these uh, very, very strange takes. Um, so I think plants have a very broad category uh, and a broad use, and you can do a lot of different things with them, um, whether they're very quick uh, attack or, you know, monsters like a, like a veggie pygmy or a thorny, or if they're more an ambush predator like an assassin vine. I went for the more assassin vine-esque direction with my, uh, my take. I'm trying to find where I put this. The monster manual reads uh, or says that plants are, in this context, vegetable creatures, not ordinary flora. Most of them are ambulatory and some are carnivorous. The quintessential plants are the shambling mound and the treant. Fungal creatures such as the gas spore and the myconid also fall into this category. Well, they really do a poor job of actually describing what plants are, what plant creatures are, but I think we have some idea. Vegetable is a weird descriptor. I would agree, Frosty. Um, I think vegetable is referring to vegetation, not the, um, the fruit of vegetation. As, uh, oh, close that guy. Thank you for the five bits. Uh, much appreciated. But yeah, I think, I think that's what they mean by vegetable. It is of vegetation. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about the direction we're going with when we're making a monster. So when you're making a monster, you really want to think about why you or another dungeon master would ever want to use the monster, right? What about this monster is a unique or engaging experience for players? Um, here's a great example. You look at the goblin. The goblin is a very quintessential creature. It's a little sneaky, it's pretty dumb, uh, and it's pretty easy to bat around. It's, it's such a, a, a bread and butter creature that's just always existed. And for that reason, that works really well. But if you were to create your own little creature like a goblin and be like, yeah, here it is. It's my little mole person, and they're sneaky, and they hop right, and you do pretty much the same thing as a goblin. I feel like a lot of players would just be kind of confused, like, well, why didn't you just use goblins? It's kind of weird that we're using this other strange thing that's just like a goblin, but not. And so you got to think about what new experiences uh, your monsters are really going to, to, to bring to the game. Uh, and I think in, in a lot of plants, it's how the combat like begins, right? How the plant, how, how a battle with the, the creature starts. Um, and I wanted to try and encapsulate that with my, my uh, creation, which was the cold snap. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like a kobold, they're sneaking, they hop around, they're kind of stealthy, but they use traps like goblins. I feel like, I feel like the kobold V-Bunny is a little, is like distinct enough from the goblin because the kobold, isn't really as sneaky, actually. They're more, they're much more focused on their, on their traps and their mechanisms uh, than they are necessarily like goblins, right? And, and in five fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, goblins have like, they can hide as a bonus action and stuff to represent that kind of sneakiness uh, and that kind of gorilla tactic. Whereas kobolds don't really have that. When they do have to fight uh, head on, right? They have, they swarm and that's, how they fight with their pack tactics. So it's a little difference in just how they fight that I think is enough of a difference there, V-Bunny. But <laughs> after I misheard this vegetarian creature and laughed, hmm, this vegetarian creature can be carnivorous. Oh. Uh, hello, evil monk. Uh, ev I'm sorry, not evil monk, evil honk. The evil honk, welcome. Is that like a, a very, very diabolical goose? Uh, plant goblins are just a small for Warhammer 40k orcs. Yeah, it, well, and, and that's the key. Sometimes it's okay to have, uh, <laughs> oh, sometimes it's okay to have, um, you know, similar ideas in, in monsters. But when you're making something unique and you really want to market it to people, 
you want to make it unique. You want it to have a different, unique kind of game style. Oh, I guessed right, Evil Honk. You are a goose. I really like your enthusiastic voice. Oh, thank you. I'm feeling, I'm feeling the energy today. I'm feeling good. We've got a lot of fun things to talk about, so. Uh, dragon fruit of the plant version of pangolin. Uh, ambush creatures they attack when mistaken for fruit. Yeah, exactly, 12-sided guy. He was saying that earlier. I think that's a really great point, right? The fact that, like, you could have a fruit, um, like a, a, a plant monster that looks like a fruit, but when the player goes to, like, grab it or something, right, it unfurls and it's this monster, right, that just furls up and looks like a fruit when it's hanging from a branch. That's a really great plant monster. That's a really, 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 really great take on a plant monster because it provides a unique experience for the players to, to discover and to interact with in the world. You know, even if it's just a one-time, oh, God! And that works really well. The gelatinous cube, anyone who's played Dungeons and Dragons for a really long time and done a lot of dungeon mastering knows the joy of introducing a group to a gelatinous cube for the first time where they just see the gleaming, you know, gem sitting on the ground in front of them. Oh, it's just a shiny gem on the ground? And I don't see any traps? Yeah, I go pick it up. All right, you step into the gelatinous cube. <laughs> oh, no! Right? It's an awesome, fun, new experience. And um, I think that's the kind of stuff you want to look at, when you, especially when you're talking about plant-like creatures, just because of their more, <sighs> typically, more stationary nature. Um, but yeah, and it's also a matter of their disguise. A lot of plants have, you know, a uh, some sort of disguise or, um, you know, when they don't move, they're, you know, easily mistaken for a plant, right? Like a normal, a non-monstrous plant. Uh, a lot of things have that. So like that fruit monster, the 12-sided guy was saying, right? When, when uh, emo you know, when, well, it remains perfectly motionless. It is indistinguishable from a something, something fruit, right? Evil Honk says, you're new to D&D. &D. Well, welcome, Evil Honk. I'm glad that you're here. And I just finished reading the player's handbook. Oh my God, you read the whole player's handbook? Power to you. You're in, you're in for a good start. We were friends at the game store, Big Magic Gathering players. And there are some of my favorites ever. And I just released a book for that. So I want to try and play for the first time and be the DM so I can make an awesome Zero's Adventure. The only problem is I don't know where to start. Evil Honk, that's a really, really good question. Gosh. There are a lot of ways you can start playing 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, or any role-playing game for that matter, any tabletop role-playing game. You know, you could start by, like, buying a, a module, like a book, um, like, like the Mythic Odysseys of Theros, or... Um, Another example would be uh, The Lost Minds of Phandelver is kind of the starter set for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there's a second one called, I think, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. Um, I would probably recommend, I mean, it depends on your group, right? Some of your players, if you're all into Magic the Gathering and you all understand Magic the Gathering, you could just play off the stuff you know in Magic the Gathering if that's something you guys are really really care about, right? You could say, all right, you are in, I don't know, Akros. I don't know much about Akros, I apologize. But you're in Akros, this magic, uh, this mystical city of wonder and grandeur. The Colossus stands over the harbor. Uh, it's a very fantastical setting, um, you know, and there's all the great, wonderful, you know, things about the, the sea and stuff. And you want to make it a naval adventure because all players are starting in Akros, and maybe you have to sail across the ocean to deliver a thing from one of the Theros got, you know, one of your player, one of the characters in the party has been chosen by one of the Theros gods to deliver this message across the sea to, I don't know, insert planeswalker that I don't know about here. Um, and that's like just the premise. You can make it a really short, simple concept that's all that they have to do and that's the whole campaign and it might just be a short form campaign and all of the adventure is them sailing across the ocean on their ship and running into islands filled with cool monsters um and maybe there are reasons they have to stop at the island right maybe they get they shipwreck on one and they need a couple days in the island to prepare to repair or 
um, maybe monsters board the ship in the night and kidnap some of the crew and the party has to go uh, into the, 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 you know, the jungle to rescue them, or they have to swim down beneath the waves, right, to confront the Tritons who've captured them. And just thinking about those kind of things, and then you can look at some of the content that exists already for 5e. Um, a great example is there's a, a book called, um, what have it here? I don't. Yes, I know. Ghost of Saltmarsh. Nice, simple book. Has a lot of great stuff about running adventures at sea. It has a whole bunch of adventures in it, like little mini one-off adventures that you can run for your party. And even though it's based around this town called Saltmarsh, it's kind of a backwater and super slummy, you can run most of these adventures without worrying about the town of Saltmarsh. You can just have them be little insert adventures uh, to the book that you're trying to, or to the adventure that you're trying to run. So that could be like an idea. Um, a lot of the times, I know that the, the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, which is a very uh, beginner friendly book um, that's a starter, uh, a starter set for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, it also has a bunch of kind of one shot adventure kind of formats. It has a bunch of like sub adventures, very modular in nature. So you could um, um, you could take little bits out of that too, or something like that to help run your games. Um, so I can just grab an adventure as a skeleton, uh, as a skeleton, and instead of Salt Marsh, it's Satessa or Akros. Yeah, absolutely, Evil Honk, absolutely. Um, it doesn't work 100% all the time, but I think more often than not, you can make it work. You just replace your NPCs with the NPCs that you want them to be. And you replace the town of Saltmarsh in here, which is great. You know, the Saltmarsh is a, a very flushed out, nice town in here. It's got a lot of NPCs, a lot of complex motivations going on. And you can say, oh, screw that. I don't care. I don't need that information because I know everything that I need to know about Akros or Satessa or, or whatever the setting I want to use. So I would recommend something like that. I'd pick uh, something that already exists and think, all right, how can I make this my own. And yeah, the Ghost of Salt Marsh is a good starting point. So is um, the, my brain just, Dragon of Expire Peak. Uh, I hope that helps, Evil Honk. Um, one of the best things about dungeon mastering is you can just make up whatever you want. Whatever, until you tell the players that, you know, until you tell the players something, it doesn't exist. So, until you tell them that you're running adventures out of the Ghost of Salt Marsh, you're not. You're running your own adventures in Theros that you made up. And that's fine, right? Because you're, what you're doing, you're taking those adventures and you're adapting them to how you want to run them. I'm just not feeling the generic feel of pre-made adventures and I want to play for the magic feel. Uh... Oh, absolutely. Uh, Evil Hunk, of course. You can, uh, you can absolutely make stuff up. I wouldn't recommend changing like rules on them. So, you know, I wouldn't change something like the rogues sneak attack, how that works um, without, you know, first really talking to your players about it. But uh, yeah, absolutely. You can just make up whatever you want and that is perfectly fine. You can decide that a Hydra has attacked uh, Satessa and the Hydra did so. And when that happened, something happened near the port, I assume there's a port there, and, and no one knows what's going on. And as the players unravel the mystery, they find out, oh, well, the Hydra was lured there by the merfolk because the, I don't know, something, right? There's a lot you can just make up and just decide is, is true, so. Sorry, I got super sidetracked, but I really hope that helps Abel Honk. If it doesn't, well, I, I tried, <laughs> but also we got a pal, uh, my pal Matty Morgs, who streams not tonight, but all, he streams a lot over at twitch.tv slash Matty Morgs, who talks a lot about adventure design, uh, character design, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, his channel is an awesome resource uh, for, uh, for that kind of stuff. Hey, Matt. Hi, Matty. Uh, Matty with the oh my. <laughs> um... 
because the merfolk have cheeseburgers and the hydras love cheeseburgers. You know, be funny, you got it. We're all about those cheeseburger loving hydras. Uh, man. But jumping, jumping up. Cold snap. <laughs> this is a monster. I'm going to just really be brief about this uh, because I don't think talking about my stuff here is super important. I just wanted to give you guys the idea of what I was going for when I made this creature. And you notice I have a stat block here. I made a stat block for this creature. I've got its size, its armor class, its hit points, its speed, and its features, and all this kind of stuff. And the concept I wanted to make here... <laughs> oh, is Pete on Discord now? Is Pete? Ah, who knows? I'm not stalling for Pete and Frosty, but I appreciate the, the compliment. I'm not that, not that master plan. Not, not that big brain. But my plan for the cold spark, uh, the cold snap, my plan for the cold snap was I wanted to make a monster, a plant monster, and, I, and my thought was, well, what is the thing that makes this plant monster interesting and unique to run into? What is the thing that makes this an exciting creature? And my thought was, I'm going to say it looks like an igloo. It looks like, you know, a little snow hut. And that a player might, you know, a player might be adventuring in the Arctic and see a igloo in the distance and be like, why is there an igloo here? And go to explore it. And then suddenly the igloo attacks them because it's actually this plant that has covered itself in snow. And that was the direction I wanted to go with for the cold snap. Uh, I thought that would be a fun and unique experience for players in an Arctic environment to to have and to explore and to go like, oh no, about. Yeah, uh, an igloo plant mimic, exactly after, precisely. Uh, and so what I did is I gave it its core feature, which does what it do what does what I want that to do. When the cold snap remains motionless, it gathers falling snow. Over the course of one hour in light or stronger snowfall, it becomes indistinguishable from an igloo. Super easy. Uh, and then I gave it spindly forms, which lets it share space with creatures. That doesn't really matter. That's some rules minutia. I gave it a basic attack, which it just whips people with its limbs and I guess grapples. Wow, I mean, it's scary. Um, and then I gave it its core ability, which was snap, which plus five to hit, which was just a math thing. Don't worry about it. Uh, and it's each creature of size large or smaller within reach. So everything that it's that's in the igloo. Uh, the target is trapped within the cold sparks twisting limbs, the cold snaps twisting limbs. Uh, while trapped in this way, the target is strained, has half cover from attacks and other effects, and takes 11 cold damage at the start of each of its turns. If the cold snap dies, its limbs loosen, and any creature trapped within it are no longer restrained. So it kind of forms this little dome, and the, the characters go inside it, like wondering what's going on, and then it snaps shut on them. Uh, yeah. A cold snap is a large carnivorous plant made up of twisted, dry, vine-like limbs stretching out from a central bramble. The cold snap is an ambush predator, stretching out its limbs to form a dome-like shape and becoming covered in falling snow. Appearing as a snowy hut to those in search of respite, it lies in wait for an unsuspecting warm-blooded creature to wander to its doom. So, nice and straightforward, and I'll be honest, this is where I'm going to tell you I was lazy. Besides the snow cap design, uh, disguise and spindly forms part, which it really don't matter too much, this monster was almost entirely ripped in terms, it's very, very similar to the man trap, which is a monster from Tomb of Annihilation, uh, the map module, which is a plant that eats people. It wraps, it's a Venus flytrap monster. And I just said, well, this is kind of the upside down Venus flytrap monster. It works basically the same way except it kind of runs around a little bit on its twisted little legs. So yeah, a pretty straightforward thing. Again, this snap feature is very similar to the, the engulf feature. I mean, I think I stole most of the language right from the, the man trap, but with a little bit of a, an Arctic taste to it. So mine's kind of the laziest, uh, <laughs> 35 feet shimmy. Yeah, he's very fast. My thought, right, is it's almost like a spider with its twisting vine-like uh, uh, vine -like limbs. Oh my gosh, I love that Baby Yoda emote. My goodness, that's very good, James Norris. 10 out of 10. I, you got some really good emotes, hot damn. Like, those are some good, good emotes. All right, I'm getting distracted by the emotes. 
but yeah, that was my take. Uh, I thought it would be a fun <laughs> my plan for Cold Spark is to make them unique and interesting. I mean, Cold Snap. It's just hard because Cold Spark and Cold Snap are so similar. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my take. Uh, we got a whole bunch of other responses. Though I wasn't the only one who made a plant monster. I know, I know Pete did, but that Pete didn't read it correctly. So Pete made a dandelion monster at first. So I don't know if he went back and made an Arctic monster. Um, Frosty made one. Z Bunny made two. Uh, uh, Jin Hall made one. After made one. Flipno made one. And Angstaza made one. So we got a whole bunch of cool ideas to talk about. And again, the whole point of this exercise isn't to have a you know stat block like this that like i could run this technically um it's not perfect but whatever I could, right that's not the point of this exercise the point of this exercise is to get what kind of cool ideas do people come up with because wizards obviously doesn't think there are any because they haven't made any uh so obviously we can be a little bit more clever than i think so at least let's uh let's zoom in uh this is one created by uh, Frosty Pirate. Frosty, start with yours. <laughs> um, this is the uh, Moranus Ring. Interesting. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And I like that you gave it a little quote. I, I love the little quotes. A lot of monsters in the Monster Manual will have little quotes associated with them. Beware, travelers, when walking the winter wastes that span the lands between ten towns. Many dangers lie in wait. The unremarkable, often the most precarious. Take note the rings of fescue, which, uh, which grow so often through the snow. Never tread upon them, lest you and your cart be swallowed whole. The Rangers of Ten Towns. So this is specifically tying into the lore of the Forgotten Realms and the Ten Towns of Icewind Dale. But fescue is grass. See, I didn't know that. Thank you that we were learning a word here. Uh, oh my gosh. Oh my goodness, apparently Flipnote made eight. Holy moly. That's a lot, Flipnote. Uh, well, we're going to get to those in a little bit. Uh, yeah, so it's a, hu a huge burrowing plant monsters that lie in wait beneath the frozen wastes of Icewind Dale. Their cone-shaped bodies are spiraled with powerful uh, contract contracting sinew, which they use to both constrict their prey and burrow through the earth. These creatures can lie in wait for weeks at a time, uh, waiting for an arctic hare, a hungry caribou, or wayward traveler to come across their trap. From the surface, uh, all that can be seen is a large ring of fescue grass protruding from the snow. However, just below a thin leathery leaf covers the hungry maw of the Moranus ring. Once the creature steps into the ring of fescue, and uh, the leaf and snow give way, sending the creature tumbling into a pungent vat of stomach acid. Then the Moranus ring tightly exudes its body, restraining the prey while burrowing deeper into the earth. Oh boy. All right. So I love the idea. You basically turned the concept of a pitfall into a creature. So this is a very common idea, right, of, of a trap, um, but executed as, as a beast. I love the idea of it being um, kind of like almost like a, almost like a Venus flytrap, so you fall in it. Um, I love the idea of the grasses. You've given a very evocative kind of visual of, of how you could, what something you would describe to, in terms of tools a DM would want to use if they want to use this creature. You've given them the tool. You've told them this is the thing that players see when you want to use this creature, this ring of grass in the middle of the snow. Something weird out of the ordinary, the players are going to explore it. They're going to be like, whoa, that's weird. I want to know. And that is going to drop. That's good. That's like really important thinking about that. And that's a unique play style, right? That's a unique play experience for, uh, uh, for, for players, right? Why is there this grass coming out of the snow? It, it evokes, a, evokes a question. So I like that a lot. Yeah, almost like a hidden pitcher plant. Exactly, Grogan. Very much like it. Um, and I see Angstaza, I'm glad to hear Stopper wasn't mandatory. I thought the instruction said, you don't need to stat it out, just a strong concept of the creature. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's mostly about how the creature survives. It's kind of ecological niche a little bit, but mostly what makes it a unique experience uh, for the players. Like, why would a dungeon master? So, um, yeah, so I guess you put some DM notes here. I like that. Uh, Ring of Fate, yep, they haven't heard it. Legend, one of them falls in. Oh, it's a legend. I love that. 
see, using the word legend there makes it feel like, oh, this is the kind of thing to be told around, you know, taverns, right, late at night or something. Um, ah, I see other creatures. Oh, they, uh, players know about the plant monster and therefore avoid the rings, but end up in a pitched battle with a different dangerous monster among the plant traps. Bonus monster, bonus if the monsters can push them around. Yeah, so I like that idea too. That's something that maybe you could have said a little bit more even explicitly. Say, other creatures native to the area, right, use the Moranus rings to like trap their prey, right? That would be a, a cool idea. Kind of like, you know, ancient man, you know, scaring the mammoths up into the corner by the cliffs or whatever. Um, I think that's a really cool ecological use of the, of the, uh, of the monster. Uh, NFC just went out of ahead of them and learned the danger. Uh-oh. Just in time, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love this. And you gave a little bit of direction for... Oh, I see. I hear it, Pete, right? Pete, you there? But oh, oh, I'm sorry. I hear Pete over... A different Hi, thing. I'm here. I'm having a problem getting my camera working. Pete, take your time, my dude. Uh, and I, I like the little bit of description for where you came up with the... the, the uh, the name. And of course you gave the basic descriptors. It's huge, it's a really big monster. Uh, it's a pit trap plant, restrains things that fall in, probably does acid damage. You gave it a burrowing speed, but I almost feel like you could make this an immobile creature and maybe give it like just a vine whip thing where, you know, once it has done its main attack, right, once it's unveiled, the puzzle is getting away from it. Right, it's not really a, a threat any longer. So that might have been, that might be the direction I would take if I were statting it out. But I, I really like this. I think this is very, very cool. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming up with it, uh, Frosty. And I can already tell we're, we're going to be in for some very exciting, uh, exciting monsters tonight. Oh boy, we got some more chat. Uh, uh, 12 sided guy was saying an Arctic themed plant for monsters, a cotton killer. This guy itself is Arctic cotton grass, and when aggroed, uh, uses mist to give creatures disadvantage against it. Yeah, I think that would be very cool. It's like almost like a, um, a very, very flat, like grass creature that uh, can give off some kind of maybe a cold, an icy mist around it, uh, or something else. I think that'd be a very cool concept for a monster 12 sided guy. Uh, uh, Pete, everyone's saying hello. I don't know if you can hear me, but everybody says hello. Let's move on to hi, this, this hi next everyone. one. <laughs> Just trying to get... Jeremy, I've never seen this happen, literally, ever. All good, my dude. All good. You're not even on camera for the stream right now. You're just voice, so... I might have to be a disembodied voice for a little while, because I'm not sure what's happening. Maybe you try the classic reboot, Pete. <laughs> the classic reboot. The, turn it off or turn it on again. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it one of those, see how it works. <laughs> Uh, sorry I was late, everyone. I'll be here shortly. <laughs> I see. V-Bunny, you're telling me I should check the workshop. V-Bunny, can you... Is this the wrong Carnifier? I don't know which one's the right one. Have I, have I picked the wrong one, V-Bunny? V oh, I see. You sent me a new one. I'm gonna... Well, it's a new Carnifier, boys. We're on, we're on to something new. All right. This is the Carnifier. This is the creature created by V-Bunny23. Uh, and the concept of this one is, um, well, it's kind of exactly what, like, I'm not going to say it's the low-hanging fruit, but I think this is what most people would think of when you think of plant monster in the Arctic. It is a pine tree with a huge mouth that devours you. Right? Am I wrong, V-Bunny, with that? Uh yeah, when, when it remains motionless, it becomes indistinguishable from a normal tree. Um, yeah, so I, I, I see you gave it a stat block. I'm going to scoot past stat block and see what you have down in the description, because that's where I want to start with. Uh, the carnivore is a very dangerous creature. A, carnifier, a carnivorous carn, car, a carnivorous conifer of the genus Aetis, and is related to the common pine. That is a funny phrase. The carnifier moves about by using its powerful roots to push it in a particular direction. This plant eats its food through swallowing it with its large trunk after beating it with its branches and grabbing it with its roots where it drags its prey, uh, with which it drags its prey. While it looks like a common tree with white bark, it will often cover itself in snow and jump out at the last moment to eat its prey. The most common food for this huge tree is small beasts, 
but is known on occasion to eat animals the size of bears. This creature repopulates via cones, which are spread by animals. <clears throat> the Carnifera needs a cold environment to survive. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Resistance to necrosis, give them regeneration. You give them regeneration. Uh, if they should be taken out of the cold environment, close to direct sunlight, they lose the ability to, keep, to produce this acid and will slowly decay to nothing. Um, it is very rare to bring hunted for its wood, which is very luxurious, uh, in a unique silvery tent which shines like fine marble. Um, many hunters are searching for a carnifer. It is a very dangerous expedition and very few have returned. It is unknown whether the carnifer did them in or simply the frigid cold or possibly another form of wildlife in Icewind Dale. All right. Uh, a common coming of age ceremony for 10 towns is chop one down and bring it back to town, proving you can withstand one of the great evils of the frigid north. So I like it. I think conceptually you've got something going here. I'm just looking at it. I'm seeing a lot of kind of the same, the same things like I do. I, I tend to notice everybody. I think you're going a little too much here. I think you, you've given this a lot of stuff. Uh, it's got four features, what, one, two, three, four, five, six different attack options. Uh, it's got three, like, I don't understand why it's got athletics proficiency. What, what kind of trait? I mean, I guess that like kind of works. I think you want to just tone it down a smidge. Um, I get what you're going for uh, with with the with the creature, um, but in terms of actually like executing the stat block of it, I think conceptually, you know, it's fine. It's very fun, but that would be my recommendation: is is toning it down, just have a little bit less going on. Um, athletics for lifting, yeah. I mean, that's fair, but. Athletics isn't a stat, isn't a skill most monsters get typically. Like, and th this isn't one that I would typically, I would think of um, as being particularly athletic. Yeah, well, I think the grapple, right, you can just put on in, in the actual features, probably in the grasping root, right? Uh, yeah, you put that, put that down here. Exactly where I'd expect it to be. I mean, this is uh, pretty much exactly what I would expect. Oh, I like that you... Uh, you gave the root its own armor class and, and little bit of hit points if players want to attack the roots. That's something that, like, every monster that has, like, a long grappling appendage, like, I feel like every player wants to be like, oh, I'm going to attack the root that's grappling them. And there's, like, three monsters that actually have info for that. And it's always really frustrating when the player's like, well, I want to, I want to, like, cut the, the limb and free my friend. It's like, well, but you can't because it doesn't have its own armor class. So I'm glad that you did that there. Uh, it's very fast, 30 feet. Everybody, I love, how did this move 30 feet? It's so quick, he's so fast. It's a very frightening tree. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of concepts, I love the concept. It's very fun. I liked your snowy camouflage thing here too. The advantage with the, with the snow terrain. Uh, all right, the next, uh, so the next monster, also by V-Bunny, interesting one to, to talk about, is the Lycanthrope. Oh, V-Bunny, you're goofing me here. This is a, a very, a, a very good pun. Um, and I see, so this is a plant Lycanthrope, it looks like. You, you're either, you're part person, part plant, you have plant lycanthropy? Uh, <laughs> this pun top tier. Yeah, I'm with you, Grogan. Very top tier pun. Um, yeah, and it looks exactly like that. You've got that little kind of resistances you'd expect. Cold and fire resistance. I guess that's due to the but I, I see lichen form. Um, you're a plant which disguises itself as a person. <laughs> so the plant has lycanthropy. Okay. Jeremy, uh, I should be ready to activate. Pete, well, you're on now. Hey! Whoa! Hi, we everyone. Got him, boys. Sorry about hearing me as a disembodied voice and then me leaving, and now I'm back. I'm here for real. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. We're I'm talking, ready to we're dive talking in. through monsters. Um, I threw one on the list, too. I, I, 
earlier when okay. I was talking to Jeremy today, I was like, oh, yeah, I made one. It's like a dandelion. He was like, it was like supposed to be winter monster. And so I threw together a very quick winter monster during work. <laughs> during work. Oh, man. Um, but Exciting. Uh, yeah, we're doing this. Um, I gotta get the get it open for myself now. The uh, the lycanthrope. Yeah, and I think we're just about just about done with this because I want to talk about the lichen shape, which is, I think the core most important facet of this creature. The lycanthrope can use action to reshape its body into the form of a humanoid that is a or beast that is small, medium, or large. Its statistics, other than its armor class, movement, and speeds, are are accessible and access certain abilities are otherwise unchanged. This disguise is convincing unless the lycanthrope is in bright light or the viewer is within 30 feet of it, in which case the seams between the lichen filaments are visible. The lycanthrope turns to its true form on, if it takes a bonus action or if it dies. I actually really, really like the concept you're going with here. A shape-changing, like, almost hive mind of lichen that can assume different forms. I think that's really, really neat. Um, I think maybe you want to take it in a little bit of a different direction from like actual lycanthrop. I see you have like stuff like resistance to stuff that's not silvered. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you need to take it quite that, that literally, but I like the pun and I think the concept's actually very cool. The shape shifter right in the in the icy uh, icy north is kind of a um, I don't know. That's like that's like a thing. A uh, just a, a pile of a pile of fungus. Especially, I can picture it doing things like you know wrapping around piles of snow to like make up bodies and stuff. Like because it mentions that it kind of takes things over, right? Is that the idea? Yeah, it looks like it. Um, that's a uh, that's a cool concept. Uh, you can create some. This is very much um, I feel like the thing vibes. John Carpenter's the thing vibes, uh, where you have that that icy setting and this just amorphous blob is changing shape. And oh uh, I goodness. think you could create some cool stories that way. Yeah, and I just want to read this this description because I think that's that's really where the meat and potatoes comes in on these guys is the descriptions. The lycanthrope is a collection of organisms working together to dissolve organic material. Lycanthrope is typically found near, uh, by or near uh, lakes of Icewind Dale. The lycanthrope attaches and slowly breaks down dead host plants and animals. When a host is no longer providing enough sustenance for lycanthrope, it will take the form of a small child or animal that is eaten in an attempt to lure a new host toward the lakes and drown it. Oh, I dig it. So I see that's why you gave it the drowning hypnosis kind of deal. Um, it's very cool. Um, uh, yeah, very the thing. Even more the thing than I initially kind of was picturing. I, I was actually expecting a lot of kind of aquatic themed uh, plants because I think that's the ob or I think that's a, a very because you you have an idea of what Arctic tundra looks like and there aren't a lot of plants there. I can see why people would would go in the aquatic direction, but I like this a lot. It's a very very cool concept. And I think this would make a very interesting and unique encounter for players. So thank you for making it, V-Bunny. Uh, yeah, thanks, V-Bunny. We got a whole bunch of more, Pete. We got, we got, uh, do you want to do yours first, Pete? Want to get on yours? Oh, do you want to just go, do you want to skip to mine? I mean, uh, I, can't, I, can't, Pete, I can't access the file. You didn't share it. You didn't set it to share. Oh, well, I didn't. It. So we're going to go to, we're going to go <laughs> yeah, to James. I got the next instead. one. I'll fix that. <laughs> uh, I see. I did say tundra, and, and by I really I should have said uh, Arctic instead of tundra, but hey, so. Uh This is by Jin Hall. It is Winter's Bite, locally known as the Lycicle. I love that. Locally known as just having that little tidbit in there gives this monster a lot more character right off the bat. Um, this plant looks just like an icicle. It hangs from a tree branch and uh, from tree branches and cave entrances, and anywhere else its sticky feelers can grab a hold of. Winter's bite will feed on anything that crosses its path. This hanging carnivorous plant waits for an unsuspecting for unsuspecting prey to walk underneath and brush against it, and as soon as it feels something, Winter's bite strikes with a needle-like mouth at the tip of the plant. The appendage houses an anesthetic oh, that Ooh. numbs the flesh around the point of attack and Winter's Bite will latch onto the animal and begin siphoning life force out of it, its victim, and implant seeds of a new generation inside of it. As soon as Winter's Bite feels its host is about to die, it sticks its feelers out to grab onto the next spot to wait for another victim. The seedlings consume the rest of the life force while the animal dies, and the seedlings lie in wait for scavengers to eat the body and attach to them until they are grown, and then uh, attach to their first waiting spot. Rarely will the seedlings kill the scavenger on their own, uh, 
scavenger they grow on, as it is an important factor in the young seedling's survival. Well, hard to tell apart from other icicles, it is not impossible. Winter's bite will pulsate and wiggle slightly, even with no wind. Uh, another tell is that winter's bite will not always attach to a new waiting spot correctly. Periodically, the plant will attach the tree trunk horizontally or grab onto a rock uh, with its mouth to the sky. I love that last bit there because, you know, I mean, an icicle attacking you, that is definitely a new experience for, for players to, to come across. But just an icicle vertically sticking out from the side of the tree, that's the kind of thing that when you describe that, the players go, what? <laughs> what? what? Um, yeah, that's very good storytelling right there. Um, and with monsters that have disguises, um, I feel like it's great when you can put something about this guys that even though it's you're describing as completely normal, they have the opportunity to try and figure it out because players love yeah. figuring out that something is dangerous when it's not supposed to be dangerous. Well, it also makes, I think, the optimal puzzle because not only is it a, a monster, not only is it a puzzle, right, of them figuring out how it works, but it's a puzzle that the players can always just fight. They can be like, I just don't get this puzzle. I attack the puzzle, right? And, it, and it's fine. <laughs> and that's, that's like the expected case. Uh, uh, yeah, more likely, I would say, uh, to just mm -hmm. not get to. Uh, Eltrion Genesis is now following. Thank you so much, Eltrion. And I can't believe I missed this one. I'm so sorry. OG Crimson Schwifting. 36 minutes ago with the follow, just after the evil honk. I don't know how I missed that. I apologize. <laughs> we're now at 20 of our 25 follower goal. Oh, we're getting well close. on our way. We're getting well close. on our way to uh, our monster mash. It's gonna be exciting. Um, it'd, be a, it'd be a good day for it. We're, if, it has some, if we got them that last five today, uh, we're already doing a lot of monsters today. We'd be in the zone. That's, uh, I, I'll be honest. I was thinking, this sounds like, it seems like it's going to be a good day, Pete. I'm going to do monsters today. <laughs> but uh, I will say, I, I do have one little, con I think Winter's Bite works the way you have it. Um, it just almost feels a little bit like uh, an aberration, the way you've described it, more so than a plant. But I think it could work either way. Um, the, yeah, I, I, I can see that idea. Uh, it, it is um, a it's little... a cool monster either way. Uh, there's definitely some similarity to the uh, the piercer a bit, uh, just like I think aesthetically speaking, in that uh, stalactite vibe. But um, I guess those are piercers are actually considered monstrosities, aren't they? As are ropers. Oh God, you know what? You're right. Uh, this, which is uh, which maybe is, it's fine as a plan. Yeah, what am I talking about? Which is absolutely well. It's wild that ropers are monstrosities and not aberrations. Honestly. That is super fucked up, you're right. Either way, uh, thank you so much for sharing, Jen. I really, again, like this a lot. This is a very cool monster uh, to, uh, yeah, this is a very, very cool monster to use in a game. Absolutely. I could see myself using this for sure. Uh, after, let's see what you did. After, I think, wrote me, uh, wrote us, didn't just do this for me, uh, <laughs> wrote us, quite a bit oh, about wow. his iceberg leti. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, about, about their iceberg leti. I apologize. Uh, I, I won't pretend to, to to know everything about everyone. After, uh, after you really did your homework here. I'm going to say uh, lettuce is pronounced the same as lettuce. Thank you. I'm going to say right off the bat, just with the amount that you wrote here, uh, you get full marks. Uh, absolutely. Oh, uh, I love you, the you sketch! Even, you even have a little drawing at the bottom. That's amazing. Full marks. Ex bonus points. <laughs> a gold <All> star. <laughs> oh, you got the Pete gold star. Uh, Pete, you want to you wanna take the iceberg let high? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you do you want to uh, just read through, uh, want to trade paragraphs on this guy? Sure. Have you, have you been going through these fully? I, I wasn't here for the very beginning. Um, I, what I've been trying to do, and this is this is there's a lot of text here. I've been trying to find the key things about the monster that make the monster a unique and engaging experience for players. Right? Why should you use this monster over some other monster in the monster maze? Uh, and, and a first answer is it looks very cute from that little picture. Uh, That's but true. It's very cute. Is maybe why. But let's look at learn about the iceberg let eye. Um, iceberg uh, let eye or letties maybe. Or, lettuce. Uh, 
uh, Lettis, uh are, are round plant creatures that are commonly found in the ice cold tundra wilderness. Uh, they are spherical, uh, and they uh, they roll themselves around the flames. So they just roll around in uh, their circular iceberg lettuce form, uh, traveling in herds. Uh, so they're herd uh, <laughs> plants, which is very it's an adorable image that you've created uh, based on the picture that you have. Uh, rolling in the snow often covers them in white, uh, although they're a naturally light bluish green color. Uh, and because of their physical composition, they're able to unfurl some of their leaves to create makeshift legs, and then they can crawl up terrain that would otherwise be difficult to roll over. Um, so that's very cute, too. Uh, so you have these... Uh, just very evocative on... You just picture the herd of lettuce, like, just rolling across the tundra, and then they start to get to a hill, and you see them all stop and, like essentially go from x-wing like all range to like attack mode where the wings furl out and then they start like climbing up of it uh that's uh it's very evocative yeah uh iceberg lettuce derives their name from these sources initially mistaken for yetis by the first uh tender explorers due to their large size and offering snow-covered bodies the name eventually evolved into letty uh i like that a lot uh they discovered a plant-like in that nature and similar to appearance to lettuce the uh, the iceberg part of the name from the fact that lettuce are often found in and around bodies of water from in which they float and feed. I love it. Uh, also, saltwater vegan. Thank you for the follow. Much appreciated. So much water. Uh, the primary diet of the letty is water, oh. which off which is often more than enough to sustain them. Adult letty, they sometimes have seen. Uh, seen ramming a lake that has been frozen over to break the thin ice and expose the water underneath. In Icewind Dale, the mineral which waters provide additional nutrients to the lettuce, uh, which is beneficial to their growth. Due to lettuce buoyancy, they can be seen floating around in such exposed waters, and from a distance may appear to resemble chunks of ice. I love that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that alone, right, like, that's the weird experience. You see what looks like a snowball ramming into the ice. That's just the description the Dungeon Master gives, and the players go, what? <laughs> you say, what? And that's, that's what you're going for, right? That's the unique and evocative introduction that I think this, this plant really, really benefits from. Uh, um, also, hello, you... Jerrica. Welcome. Oh, hi. Uh, you've done a good job here. I see some of, like, the, um, the sociality of the animal. Uh, they travel around in herds. Uh, you have some sizes of the herds. Uh, and they have a natural instinct to flee as quickly as possible from anything they perceive to be in danger, even if it's an inanimate object or a friendly creature. Uh, older Yeti will attempt to protect the younger Letties. Uh, you're definitely tying a lot of things that people classically associate with herd animals into these creatures. So even though they're these strange giant uh, snowballs, it's kind of nice that you have grounded them in something that everyone can understand as well. There's like already enough strange on them, so I like that you took kind of a very traditional route for... Um, you know, a lot of their, their behavior. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of the actual, like, stat block that you've made, because you did stat them out, um, you gave them the damage vulnerability to fire, damage immunity to cold, kind of the sort of stuff that you would expect, you know, a basic ram attack, um, and some basic features. There's nothing about the stats of this monster that are particularly exciting. And that's great, because I think a lot of players, when they're making monsters get really into the nitty gritty on how to make their stat block big and exciting and crazy. And I don't know, I, I think you did a really good job keeping it simple uh, in a very good way. Uh, I also agree. actually, I like that you gave them charge. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for, the, uh, for the big ones, uh, which, is, yeah. uh, which is cool. The, um, the furl leaves is pretty elegant. Just as a bonus action, you can close and open them, uh, mm -hmm. so that way you can, you know, show off that rollout feature that they have, because uh, it just reminds me of the uh, the Pokemon move rollout. But. Yeah. Uh, and I see you have, of course, some information for DMs. Um, they can be added as natural flora fauna, they quantify anyways, both being plants. Yep. Uh, migrating from lake to lake, uh, kind of in a tumbleweed sort of way. Um... A player may mistake a, an adult letty for a snow-covered rock, and it may surprise when it is, uh, oh, and it may surprise it while it is sleeping, causing an adult letty in the herd to become defensive and misunderstanding and attempt to fend off adventures while the young escape. 
I love that right there. Like you've already taken this very docile creature. To, Here's a way that you could use this in a combat situation. Great, 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 great ideas all, uh, all around. Uh, and as a, another note for the DM is it also creates uh, an interesting combat situation where if you as a DM can describe that the creature is obviously scared, this is when you create a cute creature like this uh, and something that is kind of lovable. And I think these big circular lettuce heads are definitely lovable. Um, if you can go out of your way to describe that it's frightened, it's startled, players will take that encounter from a different standpoint and maybe not want to hurt the creature, which creates a fun dynamic of, of trying to calm it. And it adds a, uh, a new direction to turn com combat, which is, you know, it's, it's very rare that you have those kind of opportunities where the players can not want to kill what you're fighting. So. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I love, I actually really like this one as well. Jeez. After you nailed it, man, this is like exactly what we were going for. Cause you also included a way to interact them in a social sort of way, right? Lone letties are rare, but adventurers may find one to try and reunite it with its herd, right? It's like, oh, I guess you roll your, your nature check and you know what this creature is, but it's weird that it's alone. It must be just separated from its herd. And I know like the group I, I, I DM for, they would love that as a like, oh my God, the world is falling apart around me. I'm super stressed out. I need just a, a fun little side adventure. Let's bring this little letty home. It's very, very good. I love it. Delightful. Um, uh, I, I love these. Uh, I, I love these little guys. After did a great job. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Uh, v money. We are at yes. Uh, because of the most recent subscription from the benevolent Yo Mama is a bugbear. Uh, we are now at twenty two hundred twenty five. Yo Mama is a bugbear. Was that the name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so their, box, they're wonderful and very it's great. To follow. It's a good name. It's a very um, good name. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much, and welcome. Yeah, now, Flipnote has, I think, eight? You were saying Flipnote? Oh, oh you my got goodness. A lot of, you got a poops. You got a lot of poops. Oh, boy. All right. Let me let me get the zoom in. Zoom in. I'm in Vulture Creatures. So you don't have to look at them all. You can just look at the first couple and move on. Wow. You know what? I appreciate that flip note. Uh, I like, I appreciate that you got excited. Like, that's awesome. Oh, I yeah. Love, oh, my God. I love when people get, looking through these get into it. I ran out of brain power. I was going to draw them. Hey, don't worry about it. Drawings are nice when they help to, con like, I think after his drawing really helped to convey the cuteness of it. Because I would not have thought of that as cute until I saw that picture. I guess kind of from, like, the herd mentality, it's kind of cute. But... Uh, yeah, art, art is so important to like show what a monster is. The monster manual relies very heavily on its art for storytelling. Um, <laughs> sure, I made that account just to have y'all read out your mama is a monster. <laughs> uh, you guys, worth it. It's worth it. I enjoyed uh, it very much. Well played. Well played. Um, yeah. Uh, I've never made flavors of creatures before or even created creatures and have no clue if this fits into what was required for the homework. I'm going to tell you, if you got like engaged enough and like excited enough to make a bunch of creatures, you're probably fine. Flip note. <laughs> I think you're good. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's start digging through. Uh, yeah. Uh, why don't I take this, uh, this berryling, uh, pearl, uh, so, or uh, berryling, uh, plural berrylings. Uh, and it's based on the uh, the bearberry, uh, and it's a cold region carnivorous plant. Uh, and uh, Jeremy, are you familiar with the bearberry? I don't actually know that. I don't know if that's. I'm a... about to do some crazy Google food. Um, so we're well, gonna find for, out. For those, uh, oh, well, you are uh, a big berry. Okay. Uh, so let me read the uh, the concept info here. Uh, for the red berrylings, these small creatures are only about uh, one foot six inches tall at most when on all fours, uh, and about one foot when on hind legs. They travel in groups. Uh, often stay near bigger creatures that will protect them, but are fierce when cornered and or threatened. Uh, they look a lot like bear cubs and have berries growing on their heads and backs and leaves everywhere except for their back two legs. Uh, they live close to the ground and other creatures to conserve any heat that they get and manage fine on their own for short periods of time. Uh, they got uh, strong back legs that are roots and sharp claws on their front like thorns. 
Uh, they have sharp teeth, uh, but they mostly eat other plants that they can forage. Uh, and when they are desperate, they will hunt down other things to eat for themselves uh, or the creatures that they are around. Uh, and they uh, they typically hang around uh, dealos and fear turbras uh, as the turbras hunt them down to eat them. Uh, I'm curious to, oh yeah, so these are some of the other, uh, you've created kind of an ecosystem here. Uh, so these are some of the other creatures that you have on the list here. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll come back, circle back around to those once we've learned about a couple more of these uh, these creatures you put together. Uh, and there's a couple of different types. There's one with red or black berries, uh, and the uh, the two types do not get along when they encounter, encounter each other. <laughs> uh, Very cool. Some, uh, some berryling turf wars, it sounds like. Uh, but they will avoid uh, hurting each other, uh, and for some own reason, they won't eat each other either. Like They won't eat other berrylings. That, 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 check, that tracks. Um, I want to say... You did one of what I think is the master class monster creating like golden rules, and that is I need to create a monster. I have this word, the bear berry, that I want to use as my inspiration. So I'm going to combine two things that exist in the real world, and that'll be my new monster. You combine bears and berries. And berries. And like berry bush. And it makes a very, very cute, cute creature. I love this conceptually. I like that you decided some very specific things about them, right? That they spend their time around other creatures. One of the big problems that a lot of DMs seem to have is they pick a monster and then they're like, well, man, I, I want a mammoth, right? To be the centerpiece of this, this combat encounter. But like a mammoth doesn't have like underlings, right? It's not like a, a hobgoblin warlord with their hobgoblin chieftain and six other hobgoblins a mammoth doesn't have that right so how, what do i do in a combat encounter with a mammoth and well here you go you've given that dungeon master something to use this these guys will hang out with mammoths why wouldn't they right um, uh, yeah and, or hang out with anything really whatever yeah. you have in your game um which is uh, i think you added that flexibility in which is nice yeah and i think those are two very very good good directions to to take this right off the bat so uh, a fun idea that I, I thought when i thought of this because i think that literally any group of players that end up in a combat encounter with uh berrylings there's someone in your party that's going to want to eat the berries from the back of the berryling <laughs> oh, and they're no. going to try them so you should decide what that what that does i feel like that's something i would love to see on the stat block like if you you know if you defeat the berryling the berries or healing po or poisonous or some there's something you know uh, I mm -hmm. think that would be a fun idea for this monster. Yeah, I, I, I very much like these. I think this is a very very cool cool little take. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks uh, thanks for for sharing them. Let's move on to the dialogues because I want to I want to look at these now. The diamond leaf willow and other willow species. What it's kind of based on. I also like that you did that. That you went with existing plant species as your kind of uh, mm. uh, inspiration. These creatures can be anywhere from less than a foot tall to over 15 feet and carry aspects of many different types of willow plants. Their minimum height, uh, their minimum max height is 10 feet. And as they get older, they can be harder for them to defend close to themselves. They are draconic tree plants that have long vines and branches coming out from their neck closer to their heads. They can use branches and vines to attack anything outside the 10 foot radius and have four strong limbs with claws and a massive tail. But due to their branches and vines, they can't see the areas closest to their bodies. They will employ smaller animals to help protect them. Oftentimes, nice. dilos will have a pack of berrylings to help them, as they are small and don't get in the way much, but will take in other creatures, too, if need be. Their vines preserve heat, and they eat plants mostly, but will also eat fish and swishes. Berrylings Ooh. will share their berries with them, which helps a lot. See, I like that. I was wondering if the berrylings ah. like, could donate... There, it's like they grow the berries to help the creature that then protects them. It's yeah, cool the ecosystem. Uh, the uh, the symbiosis that you have going on, I like that a lot as well. Uh, it's, it has edible leaves that let the berrylings and, and travelers eat. That was are passive unless threatened, and its scales, uh, its scales are bark that can be used as painkiller, and has leaves on his hand, limbs that, pr that practically radiate heat. All right, I I like this one. Uh, I see the direction you were going, almost like a like a leafy dragon kind of deal. Uh, and I think 
although this one doesn't scream to me as much like Arctic in nature, I think mm. it does work as kind of because it's sort of anomalous and how you've tied it into the ecosystem of these other creatures. I think that works pretty well, actually, because it's, it's this kind of protective warmth that draws other creatures in the Arctic talking both about your berrylings and just you said, mentioned other smaller creatures. I kind of like that idea of almost this, the wandering. It's almost like a, a, just a different take on a tree ant. It's like a tree ant that kind of is more draconic in nature. Yeah. Uh, uh, another fun little detail. I really liked they can't see the areas closest to the bodies uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. um, I can definitely picture, um, you know, them even having like a feature like they're blind and the radius immediately surrounding them, which... Yep creates another really interesting combat encounter too if they end up the players are going to fight one of these creatures where they get the strategy of like oh well if we move in really close we can have advantage on it and then you obviously you've created this encounter with the berrylings as well uh but um i, I am just and really engaging love. unique yeah. and engaging gameplay and experiences and that's that's Absolutely. exactly what we were going for with this what we wanted to like kind of pull out of these so i i really love how the directions everyone's gone with these you want to do one more about these, Pete, and then we can move on to the next uh, next person. Um, I will note just because uh, Flip was saying this. Uh, apparently, the mm -hmm. the blackberry lings were much different. So just to highlight those very oh. quickly, um, the uh, I guess the blackberry lings are more oh. like carnivorous. So that's kind of the key difference between them. They'll, they'll like the blackberry lings will come after you. So you also have that take on the uh, the berry lings there. Uh, territorial creatures, it says. Interesting. Uh, so if you need a berryling that's designed more for a combat encounter, you could use those ones. I dig it. I, uh, I yeah. really like the idea now. I like that you did that because I love the idea of right players f running into red berrylings being like, oh, they're so cute. I love these. And then later running into black berryling and being like, oh, it's so cute. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, these, these ones are different. Um, the... Um, uh -oh. Uh, the uh, tear brass uh, is the next one, uh, and it's based on the uh, the Labrador tea and the kudzu. The kudzu I'm familiar with. The Labrador tea, I am not as much so. I'm not uh, familiar with that either. Oh, the kudzu is very cool. Um, the uh, but the tear uh the tear. I'm sorry, the tear brass or the tear bry. There we are. Are wolf like thorny leafy creatures with sharp claws, spiny leafy hides, and sharp teeth. Uh, so these are uh, very much uh, kind of inspired by wolves. Uh, they're pack hunters, it looks like, uh, with the alpha or the leader. So there is often like a leader of the pack. So if you're designing an encounter with these, you could have like, you know, the regular tier brass and then your alpha tier brass uh, to have like two different kind of creatures in the combat, which is a, a nice free one that you gave them there. Um if a, if a pack counters another pack and a fight doesn't break out, it is a uh, begrudging existence, so implying that uh, these packs, when they encounter, they, they tend to fight. Uh, and uh, if a pack fight does break out, the stronger pack wipes out the entirety of the other pack. Oh no, including pups, and then eats the dead if another creature doesn't do it first, uh, which they often get beat to the dead by uh, creatures called Kroby, which another one of your uh, monsters here. Um, the main uh i'm sorry where is that uh, the main source of food food is hunting down uh berry links oh no uh but sometimes they'll eat dealos uh if they can get the scales off of it uh they're native to the tundra uh don't worry about killing off the uh packs because as long as they're at least a male and a female there will be more packs uh so they breed and spread oh so these are like an invasive species almost it feels like mm -hmm. um and I mean, it sounds uh, like these guys are just kind of a, a plant take on wolves uh, um, for the most part and uh, at least four times a year, there are hunts that are scheduled for people to bring back as many as possible, um, and they're well cooked. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, I like the uh, I like the take on their interaction with more human settlements that you're going at here, which is like, yeah, human hunters have to go out of their way to hunt these things down, or they'll just kind of take over the ecosystem, is the impression. Yeah, and uh, I see Flip that will also really want us to look at the Swish, which I guess oh, it's based on a seaweed. Okay. Uh, these are based on various fishes and snakes made of seaweed that are accustomed to the Arctic temperature. They're relatively the size of other fish and snakes in nature and are often hunted by other creatures. Uh, however, th there are two great switches that are thousands of years old, dormant underwater and awaiting awakening by the, by the one to start the calamity. Other than the two great switches, there are five to seven medium-sized and two to three large switches that age those points uh, a year. 
A medium ones are only mildly dangerous and don't take something races. Well, large will attack anything that isn't a squish and comes within a certain area. All right. I dig it. This is a little funky, but I kind of get the idea. I think it'd be very fun to have that juxtaposition of like a desolate kind of tundra and then a player like falls beneath the ice and like, oh, and it's just like a verdant, you know, seaweed swimming ecosystem beneath it. It's a very, uh, a very neat take. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are all very cool. Uh, these are all very cool, Flip. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of them. I'm glad that you were so inspired. I mean, there's so many of these here. Absolutely. Uh, and then Angsthaza created the Taikurako, I believe. I probably just botched that. Apologies if I did. Uh, the Taikurako. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think you, I think I think you did good. I think the uh, oh. Taikura Taikurako sounds pretty good. Let me know if I said it incorrectly, uh, Angst. Uh, yes, um, uh, if you want to give us the phonetic in uh, chat. Uh, Angst says oh, thumbs I, I up. The tundra is a harsh landscape, alternating periods of frenetic growth between the night sun with long, with long periods uh, when the sun barely uh, dares peak in the landscape. Nearly 2,000 species of plants have been adapted to eke out a meager existence here, mainly consisting of mosses, sedges, grasses, and flowering plants. Stranger even than those, however, are the plant creatures who inhabit these regions. Uh, the one creature you will not see making its way across the frozen wastes is a taikarako. Uh, this unique plant creature spends most of its life beneath the surface, at the line where frozen earth meets sod, coming to the surface only when there is a heat of spilled blood radiating down into the soil. I love that. Uh, I like that a lot. As that solitary creatures, cool. Taikarako seem to be intelligent, but have not evolved to use language. Instead, their intelligence seems their ability to interpret messages sent along the common uh, mycorrhizal networks used by other Arctic vegetation and their strategic development of their innate magic. Oh, it's a magical plant. Ooh. Ooh. Um. So, uh, I like so the, the physical... direction you're going with already. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to get to the, the behavior of them. Uh, yeah. But let's uh, let's look at these physical characteristics first. Um, they've got oh, the same. I was going to oh, say, sure. even just before we keep going, I think already you've given us two really important factors that, are, like, in terms of ask, answering our question, what about this creature is a unique gameplay experience that our players want to know and why DM might want to use this creature. It it comes you know it it comes up when fresh blood is spilled in the Arctic, right there. Um, like that is a unique and exciting and dramatic gameplay experience. For sure. And it's got magic. It is a magical magic wielding plant. And I think those two things, like an intelligent magic wielding plant, plus it comes up from beneath the earth when when blood is leaked. Like those are two things that right there inspire at least me as a DM to want to use this creature without knowing anything else about it without ever looking at a stat block that was one of my favorite that is things exciting. um about the uh, the red cap is a, a creature that it's not quite as immediate i think uh but the red cap is you know some of the mushrooms grow up from where blood has been spilled and, and there's so many cool stories especially this yeah. being a more natural force in nature i just picture like the old town uh like the the tundra settlement where the people are kind of huddled in their homes have like sing song rhymes uh about you know, just when when the snow turns red uh, and about how, you know, be careful not to bleed because you'll just be taken down. Because I'm picturing this underground thing probably, like, pulls you down to the ground. But I guess we'll have to see what they actually do. Gosh, I can even just see using this as an adventure, right? It's like there's an old, old frozen graveyard behind the town. And that's the thing that's that people are getting, and it's like, that's going on in the town now is someone went to bury someone in the graveyard and they didn't come back. I was just saying, y'all are going to be so disappointed. Uh, well, well, we'll see, but I don't think so. I'm just, already sorry, not disappointed, okay. is the thing. Well, the uh, point of it was to come up with these concepts, and already you've succeeded in that. Uh, yeah, so you've inspired both of us here. Um, the, um, so, Taikaraku do not live in social groups. Um, they either live with their own species or with others. Um, they listen to information about environmental conditions and predators from the common Maya Corizal. Uh, mycorrhizal networks that connect to more common plant types. Uh, they become aware of other. So they have like a. They do have like a, a socialization with other tigerakos. 
um, and will attempt to uh, drive other creatures by draining the intervening ground of life energy to make it less hospitable, or if pushed, use its uh, sapping sting spell-like ability to drive the other away. Uh, so they're competitive, they compete for territory. Um, that's just, uh, that's cool background on these guys. Uh, do you want to mm. talk about uh, the reproduction or the hunting uh, here, Jeremy? Yeah, uh, I'm going to move on to the, the, the hunting right off the bat, because I think that's where it gets very in interactive. Uh, during the brief weeks of summer, Tekarako gravitate to areas of rich growth. In addition to the death energy from the, uh, the brief lives of insects and from other plants that fall prey to herbivores, this positions them ideally to profit from the die-off as winter reasserts itself upon the tundra. Tekarako also appear to respond to temperature changes in the surface. They have been observed moving towards areas where hot blood is spilled on the earth, consuming the death energy released by the success of more conventional hunting. Uh, should a fallen and bleeding creature fail to die in a timely fashion, the Tekarako has been observed to use vampiric touch to speed their meals as well as the creature's demise. Some reports suggest that a creature making contact with cold earth for an extended period may similarly attract the Tekarako. Uh, and some consider this a myth, uh, a myth crafted to discourage illicit sexual behavior among the young people. <laughs> of nice. That's funny. Um, well, it's actually, it's funny. You're actually on the same page as me, which is that you can definitely picture, like, this is something that is told stories about. Uh, oh, for yeah. sure. Um, Absolutely. So uh, we, we've talked about, uh, the, well, let's look at the diet here. The, uh, the tiger rock obtained vital nutrients uh, directly from the common micro, uh, mycorrhizal network, uh, and their higher functions require necrotic energy leashed from other formerly living things. Uh, I like that you kind of have... I, this is maybe me interpreting it the way that you've written it here, but this is just a cool idea. Their higher functions require necrotic energy. So I like the idea that it, it kind of tells me that a Taikarako can become a threat and become more of a presence the more that it feeds. So it's, like, it's almost dormant until it starts to really. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which, uh, it... again, is a story. Already, like, if I were statting this creature out, I'm just thinking right off the bat, right? It'd be it'd probably be described as, like, a, a component to an area, right? And it would be, you know, once a creature has become bloodied, right, or creatures that have fewer than X number of hit points, um, maybe are interact. maybe this changes the, the environment of the battlefield a little bit. Maybe healing is less effective within this area because of this, this necrotic drain. Maybe a paladin with uh, their divine sense may uh, identify this area as desecrated by this creature or something along those lines. Um, I really like those as like concepts. Maybe creatures have disadvantage on death saving throws when within certain radiuses of the Taikaraka. Uh And maybe like certain things like when a creature rolls a death saving throw within range of the Taikaraka, right? It uh, becomes more powerful. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, in a fight, uh, in a battle where like the players are battling, let's say a, a, a cult, uh, polar bear, right? They're battling polar bear. And then the Tycho Rocco also there, but not really in the fight. It'd be like, all right, well, the player fails a death saving throw. Now the Tycho Rocco, you know, enters stage one, right? It wakes up. It's no longer kind of dormant beneath. And it starts to actually intervene in the fight. And so, like, you know, over time, you know, as things go worse for the players, the Tycho Rocco becomes a more serious and active threat. That could be very cool. Yeah, I mean, these are just, like, concepts. Uh, I wouldn't, you don't have to write anything down, on. Uh, I'm just thinking, that's the kind of stuff that this is already inspiring me about. I, I like it a lot. I just went off on a tangent. Oh, there. No problem. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think uh, I think this has a lot of potential for... Uh, I, I think, like, you've done a good job of, of putting it into two different... There's a lot of ways, like, you could play this because you've given them intelligence. Like... I'm mm -hmm. thinking of the different ways that these things could sort of think. Uh, and, and this has the flexibility to either be like a big sort of boss monster where the Taikaraka is spreading and, and growing more powerful, or likewise, just an interesting addition to encounter. Like, there's just so many ways to play this. Uh, and I think it's Absolutely. got a, a, cool, uh, a cool chassis to work with here. When I read your sapping sting earlier, I considered like almost like a singer like erupting from the ground. I'm not sure if that was the concept that you had, but um, like... Kraken kind, of like, oh, kind of a tundra kraken a little bit yeah a little bit um but i don't know i i really dig this i think this is a very very cool concept Onks. i wouldn't uh i wouldn't worry worry yourself you did a very good job with this it's very cool and it's definitely a unique and engaging gameplay experience um little things like 
you know, talking about myths and how this creature might come into, like, that. that's a way that a, that a dungeon master can introduce the creature in kind of like a funny, goofy, but also apparently deathly serious manner. So including that kind of stuff with creatures, I think is super helpful. Uh, Can you read more? I, I like it a lot. <laughs> I'm interested now in Cult of the Polar Bear. I don't know, be funny. You got to make the Cult of the Polar Bear. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll do a, a cult day someday. Some cult homework. Build a, build your own cult. But uh, man, I just want to say this has been an incredibly incredibly successful little experiment. All of you absolutely rocked it with your concepts. Like there was not a dud here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll have to go back and check out. Uh, I heard the Carnifier, uh, but I'll have oh, to go back. Oh, the Lycanthrope was rad. Um. I have to go check out what Frosty, Frosty wrote. Too. Frosty wrote in chat before. I can't, I'll never forgive you for not hearing mine, uh, Pete. Um, <laughs> so I'll go back and uh, check out yours, Frosty, in, uh, once, once we're all through here. But, oh, Jeremy, I got one. I think yeah, I can fix Pete, my document. I've opened up yours. I see you also went with the stat block approach. Pete, you didn't give us any information on how to use your creature. Luckily... I'm here. <laughs> so I have the advantage of being able to tell you how to use so the far, duster. So far, guys, Pete's is the worst. <laughs> uh, the duster is a pine cone. Uh, it is a pine cone plant creature uh, that hangs in uh, coniferous forests uh, in tundras and things of that like, uh, disguising itself amongst the other actual pine cones, though perhaps a bit larger than most. Uh, and the duster's things thing is that I made this a very low CR. Again, I did this at work. So I was just a very simple monster. Uh, it has one feature, which is its false appearance. I gave it vulnerability to fire damage because I think of those uh, as pretty easy to light mm -hmm. uh, pine cones generally. Um, the other interesting Explode. thing it has is a climb speed uh, because it hangs from trees. So it has to be able to climb up trees. Uh, the primary things... Um, I, just the way I imagined it ambulating was by, you know, the, the little, like, tendrils of the pine cone. I pictured them fanning out and, like, dragging it forward. Oh, almost like a goodness. Caterpillar. Um, very, I, that's very oh, that's cool, cool, isn't it? Boy. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> terrifying more than cool, but yeah. So, and the big thing it has is this dusting. Uh, it kind of shakes and releases a cloud of dust underneath it that looks white and powdery like falling snow. So if it's snowing, you can't see that it's using this feature. Yep. Uh, and it puts people to sleep. Oh, jeez. Um, uh, so the the kind of the thing that I wanted from the duster, the the evocative like trailer for the duster that I pictured, um, if, if I could paint a if I could paint a picture of the duster's coolest use case, is you know there's like two rangers that are like pushing their way through like the Arctic tundra, uh, and just walking along in the snow, and it's just. It's just silent out because snow just dampens the sound so much, except for the occasional crunch of their footsteps. Uh, and one's walking for a while, and he just kind of realizes that it's only his footsteps and looks back, and his friend's just kind of asleep on the ground. And then he starts to get drowsy, too. Um, just the, the light snow. Yeah, uh, and so that was the duster. I went with the naming convention of, say, your roper. Or yeah, your... Well, that's very good. Uh, and I had some ideas about the ecology of them. I pictured, like, you know, an astute ranger. I wanted to have some history of them that was like, astute rangers can tell them apart because they're bigger than regular pine cones and stuff. But Well, ecology aside, I think, and I, I just bashed you a little bit on it, but frankly, you answered the question, what is the unique gameplay experience that this offers? And I think that's it. It's the, the dusting. Yeah, that's 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 its whole thing. Absolutely uh, a terrifying unique gameplay. The only problem I have with this beat is I feel like there are parties that you'd use like, huh, a duster, and they'll be like, all right, I capture it in a sack. All right. <laughs> I shake the sack around and throw the duster at my enemies. Um, you know what, Jeremy? I want to play with those players because they sound like a lot of fun, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I know, you're right. Um, um yeah, anyway, I, uh, I thought this guy was really cool, uh, and I could definitely... I could definitely My cobalt artificer will love here. your duster. Uh, terrifying, but if you're an elf, it does nothing. Uh, yep, that's actually, I think, also V-Bunny. I think you've pointed that out as an issue. I don't issue. think it does. No, this um, has nothing to do with elves, my, my bro. Uh, magic can't you put know, elves to sleep. Uh, but, yeah, this says fall unconscious. 
Uh, but this, I guess you uh, use the word sleeper later. Um, but the sleeper unconsciousness. Theme. This is well. It's the effect is unconscious. The sleep spell doesn't actually. Um, oh really? Use the word sleep. I think anywhere other than in the title. Oh wild. Um, but there's like I think there's a couple of ways around it as a DM if you're not cool with that, which is to say that magic can't put you to sleep. Well, this isn't magic. Yeah, it's like a chemical. Uh, and more importantly than that, I actually True. think an even more interesting story with these is when like the the swarm of like eight or nine of these things that are hanging down from the same area knock out the whole party and the elf like the tin man and the wizard of oz when the uh the wicked yeah. witch kind of knocks the line and dorothy out is looking around like what what's going on with my friend that's like actually just as cool to me um yeah. it's not meant to be a threat it's meant to be just almost a puzzle is really what these are because they're not very powerful they got a simple bite attack their whole thing is they knock terrifying. out and they come down and bite you yeah very spooky yeah so all That's my guy. considered hot damn everybody well done that was an incredibly successful uh little experiment we did there going through the homework assignments um you guys rocked it like i was saying at the beginning when i suggested you know arctic themed plants I did that because I looked at the Dungeon Master's Guide, I looked at the Monster Manual, I looked at Volo's Guide to Monsters, I looked at Mordenkind's Tome of Foes, and I'll tell you, there was not damn one Arctic plant. Not one. And I looked at the Unearthed Arcana subreddit, I looked all over the internet, I could not find one homebrew Arctic plant. Nothing. Well, no plant monsters themed for the Arctic environment. We've and so, got a we just fat understand. stack of them now. Yeah, we got a, a, a nice heap of really cool concepts. So pat yourselves on the back, y'all. You managed to do something that I thought was going to be a real, a real fastball here. I did not think this was going to be an easy, easy one for y'all. But uh, you rocked it. Really cool concepts. And uh, yeah, hot damn. Yeah, especially considering I gave y'all 32 hours. So <laughs> except for that dude who, 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 who submitted a uh, I didn't, actually. As it turns <laughs> out, I didn't submit a dandelion. I submitted a, uh, a duster. <laughs> uh, but, but um yeah yeah with that guys we are going to take our break uh i want to say i missed it a second ago thank you so much dnd fan for your follow appreciate that very much uh i'm glad that what we were doing here was worth uh, worth your eyes hopefully we, we see you hanging out um but yeah we're gonna be right back we're gonna take a quick break so i can i can eat some food really quick and pete can calibrate and when we come yeah. back pete, <laughs> we're gonna show off a couple of uh, uh you have a the... couple of things that you're gonna be showing off yeah there, we, got, we got some more stuff to talk about so we'll be back in just a couple minutes see you all soon